Hello and welcome to Hopkinton Wax, a new HCAM series where we look at those who make our community work. I'm your host, Norman Kumalo. In my role as your town manager, I work closely with many members of the Hopkinton community, from departments and committees, businesses and non-profit organizations, to individuals and grassroots coalitions and regional and state groups that impact us. There are many examples where exciting opportunities are realized and our potential is fulfilled. I want to share these stories with you. On this episode, we're going to meet Sharon Lizno, who is the executive director of the Michael Carter Lizno Respite Center. Sharon has had an amazing impact within our community, and I'm happy to welcome her here to share her story with us. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks, Norman. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And so, from the start, okay. how did you come to Hopkinton? Well, we kind of ended up in Hopkinton. We hadn't picked a community, but we had gone actually to the Archdiocese of Boston and asked if they would be willing to show us some properties that they had and, and actually donate them to us. Mm -hmm. And they showed us the old hospitality house on Main Street. Mm -hmm. And that's what became the respite center. And oh. they donated it to, um, to our nonprofit. Great. And that brought us to the center of Hopkinton, which was the best move that we ever could have made. We were very fortunate. Thank you for choosing Hopkinton. How do you describe the Michael Lesno Center to people who are not familiar with your work? Huh. The Michael Lesno Respite Center, um, it's a place for individuals with disabilities. Um, it's a place that you can come as an infant in our Birth to Three program. You can come to our Adult Day program. We have 70 adults who spend every day with us, Monday through Friday. You can come to our weekend respite program um, and spend the night or the weekends with us. Um, we have after school care. Uh, we have um, infant care. And we also have residential programs in town. So we went from a very small organization that just served four people to something that we never, ever dreamed would become what it's become. So you can basically come to the respite center as a baby and stay, have services throughout your life to, to, to you're an adult. So it's, um, it's an amazing place how it's grown, in my, my opinion. Very fascinating. That completes the whole life cycle. Uh, tell me more about Michael. My son Michael was um, born 16 weeks premature. He weighed just a little over a pound when he was born. Um, because of his profound prematurity, he um, was left with many disabilities. He was, he was blind. He had cerebral palsy. He had a seizure disorder. He had a, a, a huge amount of medical issues. But the real Michael was just an absolute joy. He, he touched more lives, and he, he lived for 10 years. But in those 10 years, he touched more lives than, than many of us could ever hope to do in our, our whole life, in our long life. And he continues to live on through the respite center. But Michael was, he would be in his 30s now. He was the first child with that level of disabilities ever to be accepted into the Sherburn Public Schools. And um, it was just a tribute to who he was. And since we've opened the respite center, I've had eight kids from his class work for me. And he passed away when he was in fourth grade. Yeah. And they still come and say the most important person they'd ever met and learned from was Michael. Yeah. In fact, here in Hopkinton, when I talk about the respite center, most people related to Michael. Mm -hmm. How did the concept unfold? Well, most people think that the respite center, Michael passed away, and then Mary McQueenie and I started the respite center. But it actually didn't happen that way. It happened that we knew of the need for a respite center. And Michael was alive. And, and for Michael, he was still healthy. Um, but his level of health is, is, is different. Um, and we had been planning the respite center and building the respite center for two years. And that's when Michael got sick and passed away. 
So he passed away halfway through the building of the respite center. In fact, when we used to go up to town hall to get you know, permitting and assessors off, all those things, they knew us as the two girls and the little guy. That's what they used to call us. <laughs> <laughs> that was 25 years ago. Um, so Michael um, was very much alive uh, mm -hmm. with when the respite center was being planned. So it was really hard after he passed away, after a, long, a, a nine month illness, to come back and continue work on the respite center because it was kind of hollow without Michael. Yeah. And slowly, step by step, we did it. And we did it because the Hopkinton community was so good to us. Yeah. Yeah. So earlier you talked about how you acquired the parcel of land. Mm -hmm. How did you finance the construction? We never borrowed money. That was a, that's a core value that I have, that, um, that the nonprofit, for us, it's, it's not right to borrow money. We want to be able to spend within our means. Mm -hmm. So we were blessed to find Jim Pine from Pine Sand and Stone. Yeah. And um, we actually took the house down, and there was a huge hole in the middle of Main Street, which mm -hmm. Mary and I were like, oh, now what do we do? And the policeman came, police came around and said, you need to fill that hole yeah. by tonight. And we were like, oh my lord, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> then they said, I suggest you go see Jim Pine. Yeah. And that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship with, with Jim and all of, all of the people in Hopkinton who really loved and respected him because he took on the project, mm -hmm. um, never accepted any money for it, but he was our, really mm -hmm. our general contractor in so many ways yeah. and organized it. And um, there was another John Burke who was a builder, mm -hmm. and he worked with Jim for, th for three years. Neither, uh, neither of them were ever paid, never wanted to be paid. But consequently, they had co all these contacts. I mean, Hopkinton Lumber gave us our first $25,000 worth of lumber for free. Mm -hmm. you know, it was just, and then there were all the people in town who did the stone work and did the McIntyre, did all the, the front yard work. And there were so many companies that just came and pitched in that they didn't want to be paid or paid very little. And all of a sudden, the house just was being built. And then when Michael was sick, we were pretty, Mary and I were pretty absent because I was with Michael um, and he was at home. And the group within Hopkinton that was working with us continued to work. Mm -hmm. And it was months before I came back. When I came back, it was just a marvel at how much of the house. It was framed, it was, the roof was on, and it was just amazing. And that's why we love Hopkinton so much. Well, uh, for many years I've looked for the most appropriate definition of building community. You just gave me that definition. Tell me about some of the financial supporters of the center's mission and your target supporters. Well, I think um, we, we have a couple of things that are huge to us. The Boston Marathon, which we've all talked, we've talked about many times, is our largest fundraiser. Um, Michael's run, and we're just become, we, now we're working with the Falmouth Road Race team. We had a team of 20 this year that ran, just ran it a couple weeks ago. So that's a, a really ground support for us. Mm -hmm. But the real support comes from the community itself. Mm -hmm. um, we send out two newsletters a year. We never ask any other time. And the response is enormous. Um, at Christmas, we'll, we just, in fact, I just finished writing the holiday newsletter. We'll send out our, our holiday cards that um, are each one's handmade, mm -hmm. and we'll send them out to all the people who have been our supporters and the level of support that comes back. But not just the financial support. So many come back with letters yeah. and, and cards to us you know, from, from, from neighbors that, that we don't really know, but they're Hopkinton people. And the other places our Sherburn support is, is, is huge because that was Michael's town. Yeah. So let's talk more about how you actually approach your target supporters. What do you say to them? Thank you. <laughs> we, um, we don't, we do, I do a lot of grant writing. I do that. And you know, we'll, we'll go through, I'll go through and see what other, um, what other nonprofits are finding with the local grants. Mm -hmm. So that we will solicit, but we don't really solicit. We have a, we have a mailing list. And the people on our mailing list have already given. The only way to get on, really, our mailing list is to give to us. So we don't put unknown people on our mailing list or target people. 
And if you, when you read our newsletters, it's all about thank you. Thank you for giving to us. Thank you for what you've helped us become. And in that, I don't know, it just it seems to work for us. So we, we really don't target who, who's going to give. Wow. So now looking inward, mm -hmm. what are the center's most exciting capabilities, the things you nurture so that the center can continue to do the fabulous work that it has done over the years? Well, I think the, the, the most important thing is, is keeping your, the, our staff, and they're not our staff, they're the people I work with, dynamic and, and thinking and, and planning and, and you know, give them the voice so that the program is theirs. It's not our program that they work for. Mm -hmm. It's our program, all yeah. of us. So um, we, we have a phenomenal staff, and I'm, I include myself as staff. We're all staff. Um, and they're, they're as passionate about the respite center as, as I am and as Mary is. And they protect it and they care for it and they nurture it. And by doing that, the individuals who come to the center, the children who come to the center, they're, just, they're the ones that benefit from it because it's all of us working for them to enrich their lives and to, to make sure that they're growing and they're progressing but then when you look into the town of Hopkinton, um, we have a huge grant that we got for the Hopkinton Center for the Arts a couple of year, two years ago from the Cummings Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we have programming going on at the Center for the Arts all Wonderful. the time. Yeah. The library has welcomed us with open arms. We're there all the time. Um, we do tea time in town, so we'll go to different places for tea in the morning. Um, and everybody is just really, they're, they're good to us. They, they, we have a lot of um, work sites in Hopkinton. The lumber yard, um, Michael's worked there for 19 years. Um, uh, Jenny's worked at Phipps, Phipps Insurance for 20 years. You know, so there's, there's a lot of job sites. Um, Angel's Coffee has one of our, our young ladies working there. So Hopkinton is a lot of our campus. Your comments about your programs, mm -hmm. the internal workings of your organization, as well as your relationship with your supporters speaks to trust. Yes. Trust is an important currency in the caring and human services yes. field. How do you preserve and strengthen the confidence of both the people you serve and their families at a time when many, many institutions are failing? I think because we're family. Okay. When you come into the respite center, I've heard it say many times, it's a rest. A lot of our, our the guys I, we work with and I work with, they call we're the respite family. That's mm -hmm. what they call themselves. Yeah. And the individuals who come to our program, we treat them like family. Mm -hmm. So in a, you'll have a meeting, you know, our annual meeting with the state, with the individual and the service coordinators and everybody else. You know, they'll hug you and say, "I love you." Mm -hmm. you know, it's just there's something there's something about when you are in it with a family, helping to care for their child, helping to nurture their child, helping their child to grow, and that you're just close. Yeah. We don't do it because we're paid to do it. We do it because we want to do it. Yeah, and I, that that shows to people. Yes, I've known you for ten years now. Mm -hmm. I can say uh, every time I interact with you, when you speak when you smile, I just feel the center. Hmm. If you were not running the center, what else would you be doing? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine my life without the respite center. I, when Michael was, went to kindergarten, my, my initial degree was in business, and I thought that's what I wanted to do with my life. I was in retailing, I had high hopes, but that's not what was meant to be. Um, so I worked in business for a while, then when Michael was born, I stayed home because his, his, um, his needs were, were far too great for me to continue to work. And I actually went back and got a special ed degree when he yes. went to school. Yeah. So I, maybe I'd do something in special ed, but I just can't imagine what I would do. It'd be probably something with people with disabilities, but this is my life, it's my passion. Wow, that's great. Um, today we live in a world of growing economic inequality mm -hmm. and at times 
mischaracterization of individuals with disabilities or mental illness. Mm -hmm. What responsibility do you say business leaders like yourself have to address this? I feel a huge responsibility to address this. Um, and I believe that the only way, and my, where I am is to, I need to enlighten people about people with disabilities, um, I feel. And we feel we need to start that early. So we've run for, mm, it's, it's over, I bet it's about 19 years, maybe 20 years now, the program with the Elmwood School. Mm -hmm. Every Elmwood second grader comes to the respite center for a morning and they take a full tour of the respite center and they sit down then and they can ask any question they want about people with disabilities after they've spent meeting people, talking to people. Yeah. And um, I remember the second year we ran the program, the kids all came with questions they had written before they got there. Yeah. And Mary called um, Eileen and said, no, we just want the kids' questions. We don't care what they are. And it's amazing because I can go into the high school now and they can still tell me all about their tour when they were in second grade. Wow. Um, and we have had 8,000 kids come through that program in all those years. What a wonderful program. So we start there so that kids are not afraid of the respite center, so they know what the respite center is. And we usually get about 15 parental chaperones on that tour, mm -hmm. which, is very, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because the kids walk away understanding what we do and who we are. Mm -hmm. And they think the respite center is cool when they leave. Awesome. And it, it is cool, but they know it's cool. Yes. And they talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then um, throughout the course of their, their, their time in Hopkinton, the, many times, many groups come in, church groups, scout groups, and do things for us. But then in high school, we, ha we hire high school kids for our after school programs. Yeah. And it's great because they have to replace themselves before they're allowed to go to college. Yes. So they'll say, I've, I've, we've got three people we've got to find. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, go find them. Yes. Um, yeah. But we have an incredible amount of high school volunteers. Mm -hmm. And um, you probably don't know, but Hopkinton is known as, one, as a town who enjoys and respects people with disabilities more than a lot of other towns. We hear that through um, DDS, the Department of Deve Developmental Services. That's a great that tradition. We are known in this town as somebody who welcomes people with disabilities. Wow, that's a great tradition. Isn't it? Thank you for making that happen. Well, it's the town too. Yes. It, they, they allow it to happen. They want it to happen. Yeah. The other thing that's really interesting is we have four group homes in town. Mm -hmm. And so many times a group home is considered something that you don't want in your community, you don't want in your, on your street. Our neighborhoods are so, we're part of the neighborhood. Yeah. We're not a home for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Jenny and Karen and Kathy's home. Yes. You know, it, it, that's how we're seen, that's how we're, we're treated. And for the families of the individuals who live there, it's, it's remarkable for their children to see their children such mm -hmm. a part of, of a community. Thank you. So, what keeps you up at night? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Worry. Yeah. Um, I think what keeps me up most at, at night is when we have a problem, a family is having a problem, mm -hmm. and we don't have a solution for it. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a mother is sick, and the, the, their sons, we, we just had this happen last week. and. Um, and it's terminally sick. Now we need to find a home for this person. Um, I spend many nights up worrying on things like that. Yeah. I don't worry about the financial part. I don't yeah. worry about um, how the respite center runs. I worry about the people we serve and how yeah. we, what we can do mm -hmm. to, to make something happen when it needs to happen. Well. Outside of your work, what else are you passionate about? Well, there's not a lot outside. Work is my passion, mm -hmm. um, and it's not, a, it's not a job. It's my mission. It's my vocation. So outside of work, I, um, I rest. Mm -hmm. I golf very poorly. 
Yeah. I actually have gone from a horrible golfer to a bad golfer, so I think I'm making progress. Um, I love to read, but I don't have a lot of time outside of work. Yeah. You know, I'm at the Respite Center a lot. Well, if you are not at the Respite Center, what's your favorite place to visit here in Hopkinton? I, d I like to just be around in town. Yeah. I know just um, there's so many places that, that we go when we're walking through town, and so many people who stop us just to visit with us. Um, we like to go up to the common and have lunch a lot of times. Yeah. Um, we love angels. That's, that's a standard place for all of us to, to go. Angels Coffee, Red Barn. Yeah. Um, so I, I just love Hopkinton. You know, we, keep, we keep all of our, our business. We try to keep it local to Hopkinton. We lose, use Phipps Insurance and McIntyre and Hopkinton Lumber and all the local. We believe very strongly in giving back to the community in that way. Mm -hmm. So looking into the future, what excites you about Hopkinton? The youth. I think that um, there's so much we see out there that is not so good sometimes. Mm -hmm. You hear that's not so good sometimes. I always say we're so fortunate because we get to see the goodness of people yeah. and the goodness of the kids. Mm -hmm. And Hopkinton should be really proud of our youth. Mm -hmm. um, they, there was a group that got together in the high school at Christmas time, and they filled everything on our wish list. Wow. And they brought it all over. Everything. I mean, from art supplies to hair goods to macaroni and cheese. I mean, we had enough macaroni and cheese, but we're almost out of it again. Um, but they filled everything on our wish list, not because somebody asked them to, but that's what they wanted to do. So when, you, when I see that and I see the young kids who come in and volunteer and I watch them out on the basketball court playing you know, side by side with our guys, they're good, good kids. Yeah. Watch the football team at Michael's Run is one of the most heartwarming things to watch two big football players walking across the finish line with two of our guys yeah. and the pride in their face. Of these, of, for these two individuals that finished Michael's run is remarkable to see. So I really feel like the youth is good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my next question may seem out of place given every wonderful story you have told today. Yes. Looking into the future, on the flip side, anything that concerns you about Hopkinton? I don't know. I think the same concerns, that not just for Hopkinton, but the same concerns we all have in the world. Yeah. You know, so it's not just a Hopkinton issue, but but there are some some things in this world right now that that are disturbing. The inequality, racism, yeah. some of those things are very concerning. Yeah. But um, and I feel like each of us has to do our little part to overcome those things, and if we all can do that and maybe we can make each make a difference, and maybe each little difference we make can make a big difference. But, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. What's the best advice you've ever received? Be very sure of the things you don't know and ask somebody else. Great. <laughs> I'll write that down. You know, it's, it's so true, though. Yes, it is so true. It's so true. Just yes. know what you don't know, yeah. and don't, don't go beyond that. And we've done that over and over at the respite center. When it came time to make the fire system, we said, you'll never pass inspection. We went to yeah. the fire chief and said, will you design our fire system? <laughs> so it works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but over and over again in everything, I think that's so true. Mm -hmm. And what advice do you have for town government and your neighbors here in Hopkinton in terms of what the community can do to sustain all these wonderful things, the wonderful accomplishments that I we think, have realized in the past. I think what we would request is to, for the Hopkinton, town of Hopkinton, our town, mm -hmm. um, just to continue to do what they do for us mm -hmm. and continue to welcome the individuals in our program into the community, accept them into wherever they are, which they already do, but just continue. And as pe new people and new, new businesses come into town, to try to bring them into that, that loop that says the respite center is part of Hopkinton. Yeah. 
and just so we can keep that because that's the most valuable thing we have is being a member of this community. Well, Sharon, thank you for sharing your wonderful stories. And thank you Truly for having amazing. me. amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Norman. Yeah. And thank you for tuning in to Hopkinton Works. I invite you to look for future episodes where we will bring you more stories of those who make our community succeed. And consider contacting me with your thoughts and comments or suggestions on those we should consider for our show. You will find more information and contact information on our show page at hkm.tv. Until next time, I'm Norman Kumalo, and I'll see you around Hopkinton. <music>